G'day, welcome to Chalk Cine Control. Today, we're talking to Elton James. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome to Chalk Cine Control my friend, fellow 728 member and all-round super programmer, Elton James. How are you, mate? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing good, man. I'm, doing, I'm so glad you could join us today. Happy to be here. Happy to be here. Well, um, for those of you that don't know Elton, Elton's got uh, quite the resume. Uh, he's done Godzilla, Black Panther, Gemini Man, the recently released Suicide Squad, and you've also got Hawkeye ha coming up soon, haven't you, mate? That's correct. Yeah, we finished shooting that uh, end of April. So good. I think good. that comes out this coming November, sometime like that. It's quite a slate of work you've got there, man. Yeah, I've been I've been lucky. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Well, I'm I'm glad you could join us. Um, you're certainly a man with a lot of knowledge, um, and we're going to try and peel back some of the layers and and see how you got to that place that you're in today. Like I describe what I do to people and it's like, I say it's like playing a giant video game. And to me, that's kind of what it feels like. It's like you've got this big thing and there's all these buttons and screens and you know, like you just, it feels like playtime. Um, yeah. Once you're up and doing it, I mean, you know, there's the setup side. And I mean, me personally, I really love like setting up a show and, and mapping out the network and working out where everything's gonna go and like the planning side and, and like, you know, the building blocks, getting all the building blocks together. But once you've done all that, it's like playtime. Yeah, it's, absolutely. You know, I, you know, I feel, I feel very similarly. Like one of my favorite parts to uh, my job nowadays is uh, typically when I start a job, I, I started about six to 10 weeks before we start shooting. So that means I've, I have sometimes two, three months of just planning out what our show's going to look like. Uh, and I'm, and during that time, I'm sitting with the, sitting with the gaffer, drawing light plots, drafting 3d plots of everything, working with the rigging gaffer, figuring out how our, how our infrastructure is going to be built out for all of our stages. And then I'm just kind of spitballing about cool things that I would like to try out. Mm -hmm. Um, and like one of my favorite things is setting up the perfect rig, setting up the perfect lighting control setup that lets me kind of dial in everything and gives me, gives me the ability to be flexible to a ridiculous extent. Yeah. Um, which I feel like it should be the name of the game for anybody doing our position, our job. Like, uh, actually I was talking to a colleague of mine, Scott Barnes, and he was saying that our position is kind of, a hybrid of theatrical cueing and rock and roll busking yeah. where we have to be able to do both of them at all times. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can be, the only way you can be successful at that is by being flexible, by planning out a structure for yourself that is, that isn't too rigid that you can't change if you realize you've gone down the wrong path, yeah. but also thinking through the ideas instead of committing yourself to an idea mm -hmm. so that you have an idea so that you can have, all right, Gaffer's telling me I need to do this, this, and this. Okay. I can do it this way, this way, this way, or this way. Okay. Let's just sit, let's just sit on that for a second right. and get more information before I decide which way I'm going to commit to so that I can, when I get the rest of the information, I can decide which way will be faster for me to get done on set and give them what they're looking for. So it's like you, you, you like to build things in a way that you have maybe two or three or four different ways to get to where you eventually want to be, but you're not locked into any one of those particular ones. So you've got different options to like different ways Ex to get to things. Exactly. Like I always view the kind of macro design structure of even our, even as simple things as like lighting control network infrastructure as something that you you need to have a plan A, B, C, and D for initially, yeah. because it's never going to go according to your initial plan. 
it's never going to go that way. Yeah, <laughs> like, absolutely. We've all been on those jobs where we were promised, oh, this is an easy job. You'll be yeah. fine. Everything will be great. And then it nothing went the way that it was nope. planned. Uh, in fact, uh, Hawkeye, the show we were just talking about uh, mm-hmm. that I just finished, is a perfect example of one of those shows. Uh, yeah. I won't give any spoilers about the show because, you know, it's not out yet. But nothing about the way we planned the show went into how the show was how we shot the show so it was a constant every day was punting and adjusting and if we hadn't planned out our rigs and our and our structures to to be able to have a flexibility within its own rigidity because you know network structures and lighting lighting control infrastructures need to have a certain rigidity to them yeah um if if we hadn't planned it out to be flexible we would have been sunk yeah, we wouldn't have been able to move as quickly as we needed to to get through the shoot day. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and then how you got into the film industry and how you ended up becoming a lighting programmer? Absolutely. Well, um, as most people probably, as just about anyone in this business could say, uh, my story is nothing like anybody else's story on how I got into the industry. Um, I went to college studying music. I was a uh, vocal performance and choral conducting uh, emphasis in college uh, at Kenyon College and had no interest slash knowledge of a possible career in the film industry. Um, I graduated college and moved promptly to Kentucky to become an Episcopal priest because, you know, that's that that seems to track. It's what you do. Um, yeah. And then uh, shortly realized that I was not very religious. And so becoming a priest was a terrible idea. Um, so I moved to Boston to go work for Harvard University as an IT person and event planner uh, for the office of the provost. And while I was doing that, I got a call from a friend of mine who was working in LA, uh, trying to become a cinematographer, who was telling me all these cool things he was doing. And he was like, hey, friend of mine's looking for PAs. Um, do you want to take a couple of weeks off and go PA this film? And I was like, okay, sure. And I tried that. And I realized that was the thing in my life that I was missing. Yeah. Um, and by the end of the two weeks, I was working in the lighting department uh, instead of a PA because I quickly realized, oh, I know most of the things they're doing because of my theater stuff that I did in college and on the side up until that point. And that's just great. Cool. And then I decided to, uh, like any sane adult would do, uh, my wife and I decided to uh, sell everything, quit our jobs and move to Los Angeles because that, that makes sense. It's what you do. Yeah. That's, that's certainly the most fiscally responsible thing to do as an adult. Um, So we moved to LA and I spent two years uh, taking any job that would come my way. And um, at the start of the second year, I was really sick of the non-union hustle. So I decided I was going to get in the union within a year of that. And uh, I got on show, I purposely picked shows that were near, that were, that seemed like something the union would try and organize. And then I called the union every single day while I was on those jobs to see if they would or- organize them for us. Yeah, yeah. And then they organized a few of them and then I got my union days. Nice. Um, and that's, that's how I got into the film industry. But then, then on my first union commercial that I ever worked after I got my days, I was on a show, I was on a commercial. It was a Nike commercial uh, for a gaffer named Todd heater, who um, I have a lot, of my early success in my career to thank for him taking a chance on me as a lamp op who had no yeah. idea what he was doing. Um, he kind of took me under his wing and brought me as part of his commercial crew. And then he introduced me to this guy, John Crimmins, who is a uh, 728 lighting programmer. Uh, he was the programmer on this commercial. And I saw him at a lighting console and I was like, that's weird. I didn't realize that lighting consoles were a part of the film industry. I thought it was just, you know, bring this HMI over here and point it in and drop some scrims in. And I knew there was DMX control on stuff because I'm not stupid. And I looked at the lights and the lights all had 
DMX plugs on them. Yeah, yeah. But nobody, nobody in in the non-union world up until that point had ever thought about doing any sort of uh, lighting control. And I, I turned to John and I was like, John, uh, I'm 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 Elton and I'm new and. I think I would be uniquely qualified to do your job. And he was like, Oh, that, that's interesting. Cool. <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> and we spent uh, the next two days sitting in a scissor lift, hanging space lights. And the two of us just chatted for two straight days, just rigging out this commercial. And at the end of the commercial, he was like, Hey Elton, do you mind if I just throw your name out there? If you're ever like, if, if I get a call and it seems like the right one for you. And I was like, uh, yeah, go for it. Sure. Yeah. That seems yeah. like the right choice. And from that point forward, I ceased to be a lamp op and I pretty much started board hopping. Yeah. Uh, and within like six months, I was full-time board hopping and I had my first feature. I worked on the campaign with uh, Lou de Cesare was the gaffer uh, in New Orleans. He flew me out and it was, um, it was, it was like I got into that role and I was like, ah, this is what I need to be doing. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Because every day feels like it's at summer camp for me. Yeah. Um. So it was just like, that's kind of how I just kind of progressed into becoming a board op. So it was just this weird, long, circuitous route that ended up, hey, look, I actually know how to do this. Cool. I'll try that out. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know myself sort of in the last five to eight years, the, the role of the programmer has really changed. You know, it used to be um, back in the tungsten world, you, you kind of sat in the corner and someone yelled numbers at you and you push buttons. Um, now I think it's very different, especially with, you know, digital lighting and, and we're using more colors now. It's less about just the stop or, or the white point or whatever. It, it's, it feels like to me it's become... Um, programming and, and of course this is relying on who your gaffer is and who your DP is but like there's far more opportunity to be more collaborative and creative in the way that we're lighting scenes and, and it feels like as programmers we're far more involved in the lighting of the scene. Have, have you noticed that change? I absolutely have. I've, I'd say in, the, in possibly the last, mm, I want to say five, six years uh, of my time as a board op, um, I've noticed there's been a drastic, uh, change between even, even three years ago, uh, working on Fast and Furious 8, um, versus now the, the, the role of the board op, when I first got into this about 10 year, 10, 15 years ago, um, the board op was exactly as you described. It was the guy who brought up the tungsten units and the gaffer called out numbers and, you know, we were you know, they were lucky if we were half paying attention in the gold room. And we just punch in numbers into the calculator style console that we had and hit whatever number they told us to hit and it would work. And it's been in the last six years that our role has really kind of morphed from just like the specialist day player or the, or the member of the crew that is just kind of like a non tech like a technical role but like just a not necessarily skilled role into where a highly skilled highly highly sought after and very central to the to the work of the lighting of the movie yeah um and it's it's really interesting it has become very collaborative in recent years that like so much so that um Often DPs will come straight to me to talk to uh, talk to me about the lighting effects that they're looking to have. Um, it depends on the gaffer and and my relationship with the gaffer sure. and my relationship with the director of photography. But um, so much so that during prep, I'm brought into these big concept meetings to to hear what the directors are hearing from their are asking for from their mouths, so that I can start thinking about how I'm going to give the director of photography, how I'm going to offer up solutions. Yeah. And it's now more expected that less that they tell me what they want more that I understand what's needed from a film. And I offer up three or four different options without, without micromanagement of this is what we need. I offer up 
choice A, B, and C, and they choose from those, and then we adjust from there. Yeah. Uh, so it's a really it's it's interesting because we've we've moved from a purely technical role to a more creative collaborative role, um, and and a more central to the department. It used to be that we were we were kind of like secondary members that were like not necessarily thought of as a central role in the department to right. now the like in the hierarchy of the department, we're equal to best boys. Yeah. Um, where the, the gaffer and the board op, the gaffer, like I have, I have one gaffer I work for that he brings me on to start the job before he brings his best boy in. Yeah. Like I'm the second person that he brings in. And I know that happens for my colleague Scotty, and I know that happens for Brian Booth as well. Yep. I know that happens for yep. several several of the other big feature board ops that will that that role is so we we get so much information that's brought into us that we have and we have to be able to disseminate it, and we're we're kind of this nexus of information that we're now like this central part, which wasn't the way wasn't that way even right. five years ago. Yeah. It used to be more about like the gaffer and the rigging gaffer would talk and they would come up with a plan and then it just happened. Yeah. Like I, I remember on Gemini Men, um, the rigging gaffer, Eddie Cox and I, uh, we flew to Budapest to do the stage work early while uh, the gaffer, Jared Waldron, and the main unit shooting crew was in Cartagena doing uh, – exterior day exterior stuff that doesn't typically involve a dimmer board right um so eddie and i were there and the art department had changed in the time that we left the united states to do our u.s filming to the time that they started shooting cartagena the art department had changed the set designs for everything on stage wow. and we had got we landed in budapest to partially built sets and drawings that were nothing like what we had discussed in prep. So me and Eddie, without, without the gaffer, uh, we sat there and we designed the stage rigs together, just sitting in a room because we were like, well, they can't, we can't get a hold of them because they're in Cartagena right. uh, in, in South America. And there's no, there's no cell service there. And we're in Budapest, so we got to get something done, and we got to we've got six weeks while they're shooting to get something rigged. So we, yeah, we might as well put something in and see if it works. You kind of just got to make it up as you go along. Yeah, and so the two of us just sat there and like we were like, all right, we're the gaffer now. Let's do this. And it was like me and the rigging gaffer put it all together. Wow. Um, yeah. So it, I, I, it's kind of where you find yourself sometime, I guess. <laughs> So I'm curious, like this is this is really interesting how things are changing, right? Like and, and it starts with technology. It starts with the advancement of possibilities of what can be done, right? And mm -hmm. you guys are sort of the like like you said earlier, you guys are are sort of the nexus of how that technology becomes implemented on set within the within electric. So my question for you with everything you're talking about right now, these are very like new new ways for the programmer to start to interact. The traditional hierarchy is sort of changing. And I'm wondering if you have a, a prediction of where you think that's gonna go or how you think that's hmm. going to ultimately like affect the electric department. Our role is really, I've, I've been seeing it go this way and more and more that we're becoming a integral part of the production environment that um we're more and more we're the people that know where all the bodies are buried on the on the set and on the job uh and I, I i say that colloquially but truthfully like we know not only am i the guy that is that has drawn all of the light plots for the set for the entire job Sure, they're not my designs. I had something to do with them because I was the person drawing the circles and squares, but the gaffer was the one who was telling me what he wanted based on notes from the director of photography. But on top of that, I've got a big old computer that's tracking what the looks of every shot are, what the colors, that the very specific colors that we're mixing. what the And on top of that, I'm keeping a, a separate database of everything that we do while we're working. 
Um, this is something that I've that I've been developing that I actually found out yesterday that other people are doing the same thing, which is funny to me that we all started doing it at about the same time, where I keep a Google Sheet uh, spreadsheet of every color we mix on set, um, how we mix it, and what other instruments we've matched that color to, uh, and every shot we've we've like every time I record a new scene in Slate, I record that in I write that into my Google Sheet database. And it gives me a searchable, in, an easily searchable across multiple show files. Uh, just, oh my gosh, what did we, what did this look like when we shot this scene? Okay, boom. Oh, we use these colors. Cool. And I've got something at my fingertips that's a little faster to get me, to get me the information that I need to be able to feed back to the gaffer and their director of photography. Um, and and I I bring that up because I I see us as this. Uh, I think I think in the future we're going to be we're going to continue to develop into more of a independent player in the department as we already are somewhat. But now, like right now, in the if we go strictly hierarchy, the department is broken up into the main unit gaffer and then the main unit gaffer's best boy, the rigging gaffer, and then we're kind of like somewhere below them under the best boy. And I think in the very near future, we're going to start seeing that flip over where the, where the board op is or the lighting programmer or whatever our title happens to be uh, after the next contract, I'm sure they'll change it again. It's been, you know, in the last three contracts, they've changed our title four times, <laughs> but in, in the next, in, I, I really see that we're becoming like a primary Lieutenant that's equal to the rigging gaffer where we're one of the we're we're one of the key advisors to the gaffer and working directly with the director of photography similar to how in the grip department they the similar to how the dolly grips are treated where they're they're kind of their own independent operators they 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 report directly to the gaffer not not through their best boy talking to my gaffer and we're making decisions about like you know he'll he'll ask me like what kind of light should we use for this? And it's kind of like, well, I think this would be a good choice or there's this option. And so, you know, ultimately the decision falls to him, but he's asking for me for recommendations on stuff, which never used to happen. And oh, then, yeah. you know, the, you know, me and him will have a conversation with the rigging gaffer about how things are going to go together. And, 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 you know, John's usually like, look, I, I don't need to know that part. You guys just work it out and, and make it happen. And so, I think eventually we're going to get to the stage where you're going to have this parity between, you know, the main unit gaffer, the rigging gaffer and the head of, you know, because eventually lighting, I think lighting control is going to become its own department in the way that fixtures is and rigging is. And, and so whoever's, you know, leading lighting control, guys like you and me or someone else or whoever, but there's that going to be that flow down of the information. And I just think that's a matter of time because it's, you know, um, the way the systems are now so large and how they're so integral to everything that is lighting on set these days. I think eventually we're going to see that sort of parity across the board between the department heads. So absolutely. I, 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 I'd say, I'd say there's, it's, it's been going this way for some time now, but I think more and more um, lighting control is going to, is going to end up being a part a, a separate sub department of the overall lighting department. You've got your main unit lighting, you've got your rigging, your rigging set lighting, you've got your fixtures lighting, and then you've got lighting control. And we're it's it's interesting because I've I've run into several programmers and rigging programmers who have different different philosophies about it and have different wishes about whether or not we're our own separate sub department, or if we're just folded in with a different one. And, um, because we, we fulfill a very unique role within all of the other existing sub departments where we're the, we're the thread that connects all of them. Yeah. Uh, we have to interface with fixtures because fixture we're controlling all of fixtures lights. We have to interface with rigging because when rigging is putting their stuff in and when they're putting their lights in, our networks need to go in, our infrastructure needs to get put in, and that needs to be a part of rigging. And we're part of main unit because every time something needs to change, we're the ones that have to do it. Yeah. So it's a we're we're a weird nebulous department because we're 
in some ways we are we need to be our own separate autonomous entity but in many ways we're also we're so integrated into the other aspects of the department that it's it's really it's it I'll be very interested to see where it kind of lands because we're yeah. I feel like we're in a very interesting transition between light and control being a a a a shadow department to lighting control being a sub department of the overall uh, lighting department. It it kind of feels like we're in like year five of a ten year transition, you know, like yeah, it's starting exactly. to like really become paramount for what we do to make things work. And I think it's it's just as it becomes, you know, because it all starts at the top and it works its way down. Um, you know, guys like you and Scotty and Boothy and that have been doing it forever and now it's coming down to the level where you know guys like me on on you know like big streaming tv shows you know i've got a first unit tech i've got a a rigging tech i've got a rigging programmer and it's just it's just working its way down the pyramid of production um and i I think you know like obviously there's certain levels of show you're never going to get to that but i think soon enough the greater part of the industry is going to be feeling these changes and i think it's I think well it's and i think it's i think it's already there and i'll use uh, suicide squad as a as an example of that where um i was full on a the head of a separate sub department of the of the lighting department um i had i had me a onset lighting t- an onset dmx tech plus one systems foreman, two rigging rigging programmers, and four DMX techs working under us. Uh, so that's, you know, counting me, that's a de- that's a department of ten guys. Yeah. Um, that's not a sub department. That, I mean, that's not a shadow department. That's not a part of another department. We're that's a separate entity, and we were taking yeah. our. I uh, they we they were working with the rigging gaffer reporting to the rigging gaffer but ultimately reporting to me and based on me being the guy who had to sit on set in the hot seat when the dp and director were screaming for what they wanted yeah i was the one that had to call the shots about what they needed to be working on yeah um so it's 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 already that way and i can i i can tell you that's the way it it was on uh black panther and that was the way it was on uh godzilla and Dr. Sleep and the way I know Scotty works typically where he has a, uh, it, and we all have started kind of calling ourselves the lighting control team instead right. of various nebulous DMX tech terms that yeah. have no, have no real meaning. I think Scotty term uh, coined the lighting control term yeah, because he's Scotty and that's what Scotty does. <laughs> Hashtag lighting control. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you then given given your role in all of these different departments how do you foster collaboration and cooperation among these departments that are often on very different schedules and different locations have a thousand things going on themselves how do you how do you create that team spirit um i'd say the the well, there, I see there are two questions here. One is how do you how do you work with the other disparate departments slash sub departments of your own department, and the other one is how do you work with the various members of your team that are not working on the same schedule as you? And uh, luckily, the answer to both of those is is in my opinion the same, which is constant and thorough communication. Um, I've I've taken to um, using Slack. Which is a uh, uh, which is a uh, web based team collaboration uh, app suite um, that essentially is like basically it's like WhatsApp or uh, Apple Messenger exclusively for work purposes, um, where where it gives me an easy way to send to send information out quickly and attach files to it and it and it's not lost in an email but instead it's this searchable database separate app that people get notifications for get information from and that i can disseminate information out as quickly as possible uh and when it comes to working with other other departments or other parts of my own department it's constant communication with them constantly checking in constantly 
constantly being in touch with these people. Like um, the first question I have when I start a new show is, all right, cool. Who's the rigging gaffer? Who's the key grip? Who's the rigging key? Who are all of these people? What? And if I don't already know them, what is their contact information? And who's uh, who's the asset person in the art department who I need to call to get drawings from all the for for all the sets? Um, those are and I make it a point to become their friends immediately um, because their success is is tied to my success and my success is tied to their success. So therefore, if we're not constantly communicating, if I don't know this information, like in for me personally, I have a goal that I don't want the gaffer to come to me and tell me there's a set coming up and me be surprised and have to find drawings for. I want to know about it and pretend to be surprised when the gaffer tells me that he, and then be like, oh, you mean this set? And then pull up a fully rendered Vectorworks drawing that I've been working on for the last three days. Um, and be able to just plop lights into wherever his notes are. Um, because the way we succeed working with all these various departments is through communication, which is, it sounds, I own, as I'm saying it is, it sounds like a cop out, but that's, it's true. It's the, it's the most basic skill that every human being needs to have, but it's also the single most important skill we need to have in our role because we're more than just the guy hitting the buttons on set, making the cool, pretty light effect. We're a nexus of information and we're a nexus of communication between our department and various other departments. That's actually interesting because without me asking my next question, you just answered it. I was going <laughs> to ask you, what's, what's, the most important to, what's the most important skill to master apart from the console? And it seems that your thought on that is that communication is probably the most important skill you can have. Absolutely. I would a hundred percent. And, and, and that actually would, I think, uh, developing your communication skills. And I, I mean, that relates to everything else that we do as lighting programmers. Uh, if you look at our drawings, what are, what are lighting plots? They are communication. Um, to be a really good draftsman in the film industry, you need to know how to concisely uh, how to concisely demonstrate the information on a, on a two-dimensional piece of paper for a three-dimensional rig and give enough information that when there is something that is not going to be accounted for in the plan, that they can figure out what to do so that they have to come back with fewer questions or that they freelance as little as possible and you get the rig you're expecting and the gaffer gets the rig they're expecting and the director of photography gets the rig they're expecting. How do you communicate that information? So drafting is drafting is just another communication tool, um, and and just all of our collaborative stuff. I mean, it's all the film industry is a team. Making movies is a team sport. It's all about how well do you collaborate with others? How well do you communicate with others? How well do you work with others? And part of the, all of that comes back to how well can you develop these relationships that you can effectively communicate the information you need and they can effectively communicate information back to you. So given that, I'm curious because there's a lot of talk right now about the creation of a lighting drafts person role. Yes. So how do you feel about that if the programmer's job is truly to be this nexus of information? Do you see bringing a drafts person in as sort of being a an assistant and helping facilitate that communication? Do you think that that takes away from what the programmer is doing, or do you think it makes it easier for the programmer to do their job? Well, you know, this is a it's a new it's a new uh, job in the film set to have a drafts person. So it's something that I think we're really kind of trying to figure out as we as we go. Um, there's some interesting political backstory as to how that position got created and uh i could go into that but i'll i'll leave that out for now but it's um i i actually really think i'm when i first heard about the lighting drafts person position that we were pushing for it my initial thought was well how's that going to work i do all the drafting why do i need a draftsman and then i started thinking about it and then i got on a job where i had a drafts person working with me um and 
the truth of the matter is in the film industry, everything is moving so fast and everything is moving so quickly. And I think one thing that COVID has really taught us is that any of us could be not showing up to work because we someone tested positive or we were a, cl- a close contact. And then the person's out. And how do we come up with strategies to to be able to keep the keep the keep the train moving so that the film can continue getting worked on and the the lighting programmer has become this bottleneck position within our department and i view the drafts person role as a way that we can help unbottleneck our position and there is a good way for us to utilize that role without while supplementing what the lighting programmer is doing um and one of them is that um and this is how we did it on a um a giant blue people movie that i worked on in new zealand last year um um i can't tell you what it's called but you know sheep island yeah yeah something about who who knows you know they're kiwis nobody likes kiwis love you ruben i love you (laughs) (laughs) um but the truth of the matter is that um i was on a job where i had a full-time drafts person and I walked into that job very nervous that I was not going to know my rigs. I was, how could I do what I needed to do to be familiar with it if I'm not the guy putting the numbers and the squares and the circles and drawing it all because that's what I'm very good at. Um, and then it becomes that we're a supervisor role to that position. So I took the draftsman under my wing and was like, all right, cool, man. You do your thing, but let me tell you the ways I want it to work for me. And okay, cool. Here's your pass. Great. And I'll make I'll make some changes as I need to make them. Because the truth of the matter is, when you're really busy on a movie set, you're lucky when you have time. I mean, when I mean, Chris, you can probably attest to this as well. How many times have you been working on lighting plots at home, not getting paid to be doing your job? Um, All the time. Yeah, I mean that's that's ninety percent of our life is like, I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting with a beer in my hand with some TV show that I can't even remember what was playing in the background after the kids have been been put to bed, frantically trying to draw something so that I could get it emailed out before I go to bed so that when the rigging gaffer wakes up, he can see the notes so that he can change his order for the order he has to pick up tomorrow. Yeah. Um, And the drafts person role just takes one extra thing off of our plate. And it's not a threat to our position, but it's a, a supplement to our position. And it's really cool because that means we can focus more on the programming stuff and the big system, big picture stuff. We can still have our hands in the drafting. We can still have our hands in all of the other stuff that we're that we're all uniquely trained for. But as the as the main unit programmer, we're essentially the chief lighting programmer on a larger show which means we're the head of the lighting control department. So our job, just like how a gaffer has to be thinking about the big picture, how everything is going to affect everything, not just, oh, if I put this light here, it'll be perfect for this. They're more thinking, if I put this light here, it'll be perfect for this. And then, you know, when we turn around, it'll be the perfect back edge. Um, our job is to be big picture. Like it, it moves us more into that nexus leadership role of now we're able to be freed up to think think more thoroughly about the big picture and how do how do we make sure that we don't run into bottlenecks and creative bottlenecks uh moving forward kind of a similar experience for me when i was doing wandavision because i had um several weeks of prep we got there we started i would start you know conferring with john and doing the plots for the first couple sets and then once we got into production it was so fast and it was so so hectic i was lucky i had a really good um, you know, rigging programmer slash lead data tech slash drafts person that, you know, like he would send me a text message and I would be like, yeah, that make those 50 sky panels, make them start at this, put them in this universe, do this stuff. I would send him that information and, you know, I would patch all the stuff into the show file. And then on the day that we went to do that set or whatever, I would walk in and he would say, here's the plot. And I'm like, yeah. right. And we just got straight into it. And I just think, for you know when you're doing big shows like that and you've got a lot of fixtures and a lot of sets and a lot of different stages it's just so much easier just to focus on you know because for me as a program i mean i like i know guys like you and scotty are passionate about your vector works and you, and you do some amazing stuff and it's and i'm like how did you okay cool whatever i i, 
I, for me, as a, you know, like as a, a, someone who started out as a, you know, like a rock and roll LD programmer, like I'm a bit more about like pushing the buttons and creating the look and, and having that collaborative thing. And it's like, okay, can you just draw that? That'd be great. Thanks. You know, like that's kind of my vibe. I'd rather be there at the coalface worrying about the look and helping to create that look you know that's kind of like so for me personally it's like if I've got someone that's like there and we're having a conversation and they're making the magic happen and then they can talk to the gaffer and the rigging gaffer and like you know I just get to do my job which is program and create like that to me is like that's where I'd like to be you know yeah I I can see that but you know it's funny to me because um I I actually I I, I feel I, I have a particular passion for using Vectorworks because I've yeah. been, been using it for so long now. Yeah. And it's something I I certainly would never say that I'm uh, as good as Scotty Barnes is, uh, who is the board up we would all love to grow up to become when we grow up. Um, <laughs> love you, Scotty. Love you, Scotty. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Yeah. Uh, hashtag I like. Um, <laughs> yeah. But you know, honestly, like I, 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 I have a, I have a particular passion for working in Vectorworks, and um, I, I love what it does for me because in my prep on a show, because I spend so much time drafting out full, fully rendered 3D scale drawings of the stage, the perms, the the overhead, everything as deep granular as I can. I can, in my conversations with the gaffer and DP, get really granular about the information that they want me to be preparing and thinking about, about how our, how our lighting effects are going to affect the overall set. Um, and um, on, on Suicide Squad, for example, um, there, there were a lot of lighting gags that were very specific to what was going on in this particular set that came directly from the director of photography, Henry Bram. And he was like, I need this to look like this. But without me having a full, fully rendered 3D model that I could just drive him through and say, oh, so as the actor's walking across this window, you want the light to be here turning this color. And then you want it to you like I can drive him through and kind of give him little tech viz of how the camera movement's going to be. And and that just gives me an even better preparation tool I found um to be able to be a part of that, to be a part of those conversations. And it's inserted us into a part of the conversation that traditionally we're left out of. Yeah. But because we're doing this kind of drawing, we're a part of and it's all information we need to have. Any information, it's good information for a board op because yes. it's what it's the information we like. Often, I'll have a gaffer be like, "All right, I need this. I need this light to flicker. Just make it go." Bah, 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 bah. But they'll forget to say to me, "This is a part of an overall. There's a big boom that happens, and we need to see." this side of the room go over here and then this side over here. And we want to see a cool little like did, 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 they, they'll get caught in the granular telling me one thing and forget the big picture. So I found that by working in vector works so strongly and, and really fleshing out my, my models and drawings that I can personally take the gaffer and director of photography through a tour, I get those big picture this is creatively what's happening in the scene so that I can think about when the gaffer is telling me to do this one small little effect on this light, I know that, oh, this is something I need to keep in the back of my head that I'm going to have to be replicating all over the place. Or this is something that's a part of a big picture thing that's waving across the whole set. But because we're shooting a, a tight shot first of the actor uh, and he just sees a little flicker, like how many times have you, Chris, been on a set where you've been working on something and you've been given notes to do some effect and then you find out later as you're shooting, oh, that's part of that? Oh, yeah. I should have done that a whole different way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it's part of the organic nature of the way we make films that we, we, we break them up into these little parts that are unrelated to each other and then it's sewn together in the editorial. So any opportunity we have to get those big picture moments that let us 
kind of help tie things together as best as we can. We're helping our boss look good. We're helping the gaffer look, the DP look good. We're helping the director look good because we're making it easier for them in editorial because we're, we're assisting them make an overall unified look. Well, and again, that kind of sort of situation harkens back to that idea you had about like having four ways to get to one thing because you never yeah. quite know what that one thing's going to be. It's like, oh, we're doing, we're doing this thing. Now we need to see that all over. So you kind of have to be able to go, oh, yeah, these ones, doing that, load, cool. Okay, we're good. Yeah. yeah. And it has and to be that quick. Yeah, and it's so much easier if, like, I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting on a movie set, and Godzilla is actually the perfect movie example of this, where we'd, we'd be shooting one thing and we'd get, we'd, we'd just fiddle and fine-tune some perfect little flicker um, or some perfect little like lightning effect coming out of Gadira's mouth as she, as he was attacking Godzilla. And like, we, we'd fine tune this effect for this one little tiny shot. And then we turn around and the gaffer would be like, all right, now make it go across the entire rig. And I'd be like, oh, I wish we'd have talked about it going across the entire rig earlier because I would have done this way differently because now I need 20 minutes to copy and right. paste this across every the 40 different types of fixtures that you have in the rig. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think the other thing with that is um, as we get more into this digital realm, I think gaffers are finding the language that we would love them to have to be able to communicate that sort of thing. I think for me personally, like the way that those instructions are communicated has changed a lot. It used to be like, okay, bring that light up. Okay, now run the queue. It's like, hang on, you didn't you didn't ask me to record a queue. You just asked me to turn the light on. Yeah, but we want it to turn on and off. And oh, okay. Whereas now it's like, okay, we're going to do this thing, and the light goes on and it goes off, and then we do this other thing. You know, like I think they're getting better than that now that they understand more our role and and the kind of language that we use. Yeah, I I I a hundred percent agree that they that um, gaffers seem to be getting hip to the fact that we're our role is an active part of the story. So we need to, we need to be included in what's going on in the story at the, up to that right. point. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the, one of the, that was one of the things I really liked about working on um, WandaVision with Jess Hall and John Vecchio. Like, you know, we'd have this, you know, I was parked right next to the DIT and we'd have these discussions about things and I'd kind of listen in and, and then, you know, John would go off to do something with the guys on set and Jess and I would talk about stuff. And it was, you know, it was kind of like this huddle collaborative thing. It was really fun. You know, it wasn't just, I'll turn that light on at this and make it do that. It was, you know, like getting down into the weeds and, and, and seeing the image and, and watching it be created in real time was actually really, really cool. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and I love the work that you guys did on uh, WandaVision. Oh, uh, thanks, mate. It, th that was a really fun show. Um, I, it, it, it was the show that proved that Marvel streaming could actually be more than just, you know, cheap Marvel features. <laughs> so, um, it was, it, um, and I'd a hundred percent agree. Like some of my favorite jobs that I've ever worked on are jobs where it's been this weird huddle that's happening where the, the lighting programmer and the gaffer and the DP and DIT are often just standing standing next to each other and they're saying okay the dp saying okay i need the camera to do this to this to this and this happens and this happens and the gaffer looks at me and i'm like well what if i make it go like if what if i make it do this and they're like oh yeah that's a good idea well can you do it in like three seconds i'm like okay I'm already on that boss yeah. Yeah. um and like i found that pre-covid times i would always try to have my lighting console set up immediately next to dit if possible um post-covid times has been a little weirder because i've intentionally tried to keep myself a little more separate and a little more offset just to you know be safe on set and sure and, uh but more and more i've been i've been making sure that i'm i'm right there next to dit as much as possible so that that those conversations which are so valuable can be we can be a part of those conversations yeah um i remember on on venom i was working uh and and the uh director of photography uh, matthew libatek 
specifically asked that I be put on HM, on his HME, the camera department's HME, with the key grip and the gaffer as well. And so Maddie, Maddie, Dan, and Kurt and I would be constantly back and forth talking about what was going on in the shots. And he'd be like, oh, it, it was really cool because it was like I was, it was like he'd give a note to the camera oper- operator and then he'd give a note to me as if I was an equal part of the filmmaking process is the camera operators, yeah. the guy who's pointing the freaking camera. So I think, it, I, you know, that whole part, being part of the process makes it so much more fun. And, and, um, you know, like I used to, do, used to be a thing a lot of years ago, I'd sit on my computer buying car parts on eBay. Like you just don't have time to do that anymore. No, <laughs> you know? no. I miss those days. It's kind of, I know it was fun. <laughs> yeah. Sata doesn't. I don't, I spend far less money these days. That's true. Well, I, I spend a lot of money, but on things that aren't as exciting. I buy a lot of network switches these days. Let yeah, me, me you, too. I got some good network switches. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that in another video. What are the five things you'd wish you'd known when you first got into this job? Well, one of them is. Don't buy anything until you have a job telling you that you need it. Um, I remember, I, re- I remember when I first bought a lighting console, I wasn't yet working full time as a lighting board op, and I, str- I bought it, and it was a good idea. I'm glad I did, but it was an old ETC Ion, and it was a great little console. I loved it. Um, but I wasn't being hired as a board op. So I had just spent $15,000 that I didn't need to spend at that point in my career to buy something when somebody wasn't hiring me to be that board op yet. And there are plenty of other tools. Uh, another was another directly related to that is take advantage of the uh, plethora of resources that are out there um, between if you're lucky enough to be working in one of the unions uh, 728, our local has a very, very, very robust training system. I know 479 in, in, in Atlanta has a very robust training system. And I know many of the other locals have very great training systems. And then there are other, there are other resources out there, just like this, this YouTube video, uh, this YouTube series that you're running is that there's information out there. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to, to find these, this, these resources because they're there. Um, and I wish I had done a little more research on my own about, and, and been a little more pro- proactive about utilizing a lot of those because it would have, you know, solved a bit of heartbreak early in my career, not to stress about when your next job's going to be. Um, that's something that I think everyone, when they're fresh to our industry, even when you're not so fresh, I still stress about it. But it's like you finish a job and you're like, I'm fully unemployed. I may never work again. Who knows? My phone's not ringing right now. Why isn't it ringing? I'm uh, it's falling apart. But the career. Nobody I, loves me. What, what have I done in my life? It's, I've made a horrible mistake. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, within 15 minutes, uh, you're like, okay, cool. I'll go on vacation. And then the second you book that plane ticket, somebody calls mm-hmm. and offers you a great job because that's the way it works. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've literally, so, been, literally been pulling out of the gas station after filling my car to leave on a road trip and the phone call, phone rings. Can you be here next week? I was like, oh, man. Yeah, I, I remember I, uh, I, was, I, I had just gotten off of uh, a string of jobs and I had had no time off for about two years straight. Like other than, other than you know, company mandated holidays, uh, those were the only time off I'd had. And I, as a anniversary present to my wife had decided I was going to take a road trip to Vegas with her and uh, go see every show on the strip. Um, Because my wife and I love going to see live shows. We love uh, circusy things. So we went to see every single Cirque du Soleil. The day we got to Vegas, I got a phone call saying, hey, um, do you want to come do second unit on Born 5 in Vegas for the next two months? (laughs) <laughs> and I was like, oh God, what's it starting? And he was like, uh, we need you on a plane tomorrow. And I'm like, well, I'm in Vegas right now. And they're like, yeah, um, you have to 
So I was in Vegas, just offered a job in Vegas on a trip with my wife. And then I had to bomb home on a in the car, drive home. And then immediately, the second I dropped my car off, I took a taxi to the Burbank airport, got on a plane back to Vegas, and then checked back into the hotel room that I had just left <laughs> and met my wife who had never left Vegas. And we just, <laughs> and I just stayed on the job. <laughs> I just started that job. Some crazy um, rules sometimes. Yeah, it's it, it was a silly thing to follow the rules, but that, those were the rules. 